A few days ago, a young guy called me old timer. Wow, I guess I'm no longer middle aged. How the time flies. I was born in March 1945. My name on my original birth certificate is Michael David Cassidy. I've been Robert Hyatt since I was two weeks old. I was about seven when I found out about my adoption. My adoptive parents were completely open about it as I was growing up. I learned that Neil Cassidy was my biological father when I was 66 years old. <laughs> A very startling, thought-provoking, and completely wonderful piece of information. However, almost immediately, my question was, am I like Neil Cassidy? In what way? In any way? As I researched, researched Neil and read the sparse amount of information provided by the Denver Juvenile Court about my biological parents, <laughs> I learned a few things. One was that Neil and my biological mother didn't know one another very well at all. Uh, that probably isn't surprising to many of you. Uh, Neil Cassidy didn't always establish long-lasting relationships with women. Another thing that I learned, I speculate, uh, was a possibility that I inherited some of Neil's nonconformist genes. So tonight I decided to read a short piece from a collection of short stories I wrote about 15 years ago about my young life. Drive, 1962. Dave and I were on our way to pick up Dolores and her friend Nancy. The plan was to get the girls, then hang around the beer depot or some other 3-2 beer store until we found an 18-year-old who would buy us beer. It would still be six months before Dave would be old enough to do the buying, and I was three months younger than him. Drinking beer several nights a week had become a regular thing for me. Hangovers were routine. I'd bemoan my drinking when I unloaded bags of cement from, uh, from boxcars or did other sweaty warehouse work on my summer job, but mostly the drinking was worth it. <laughs> when Dolores got into the car, she told us that Nancy couldn't come out. She'd been grounded. Dolores wouldn't say why. Both girls played it free and loose, so I wasn't surprised that Nancy had been reined in by her father. Because they were both open, rebellious, and candid, it just didn't make sense for Dolores to hold back the reason that Nancy couldn't come out, but she did. Before that night, it was decided that Dolores and Dave would be matched up, and since, since Nancy wasn't there, I figured I'd drop them off at Dave's car and then find something else to do. But Dave came up with an idea that sounded better. We'd cruise around for a while and then drop Dolores off. Then we'd buy some beer. The cool summer night air came through the open windows of my 1952 Plymouth as I drove through a number of North Denver neighborhoods. Other than the top 40 on KIMN radio, it was quiet inside the car. Dave and Dolores were making out. In a while, they wanted more room, so I stopped to let them get into the back seat. At first, I could easily see Dave and Dolores through the rearview mirror. They kissed and hugged and then disappeared from sight. Soon, I heard breathing and moans, and I felt pressing and bumping against the back of the driver's seat as, I sh as they shifted position. For a time, their bodies were low in the seat, but before long, I caught glimpses of them rising up to pull off pieces of clothing. I could see Dolores looking into the rearview mirror as if she wanted me to be watching. I drove through peaceful residential areas, avoiding busier streets and the people who might see what Dave and Dolores were doing. I was able to keep them shielded from strangers until I was held up at a stop sign and a man crossed the street close to my car. As he walked by, he slowed his pace and looked directly into the back seat. 
When I told Dave and Dolores about it, Dolores got really excited. <laughs> As passions heated up, they got louder and their undulating pace quickened. The two lovemakers were on the seat for a while, then on the floor, and sometimes they were partially on both. After a time, Dave sat up in the back seat and smiled at me through the mirror. It was time to take Dolores home. <laughs> a few weeks later, Dave and some of the other guys and I went to Red Rocks Park, the scenic areas in the foothills near Denver. It takes in many square miles and is prim primarily known for summertime concerts that are held in the amphitheater. This area was one of our favorite spots to drink because in those days, the park was nearly deserted except when concerts were scheduled. And what's more, no curious sheriff's deputy or park ranger was likely to climb the monumental red stands, sandstone boulders in order to check for IDs uh, for underage drinking. That Saturday afternoon was spent climbing on the rich red-colored rocks. After dark, we sat on the top of, of a towering boulder, swilling beer, and telling 17-year-old tales. Dave then let us know that Dolores had given him the clap. <laughs> he said Dolores wouldn't admit it at first, but in time he found out that Dolores and Nancy both got gonorrhea from guys they met in another part of Denver. While Dave finished telling the rest of the story, I smiled and I drank a beer to Nancy's dad for keeping us apart that night. <laughs> Thanks.